Hello, uh, patrons and viewers of Diplomacy Direct. Today we are joined here by two special experts who are on the forefront and are very vocal about China's uh, space aggression and weaponizing, causing security challenges to the world uh, with soft and hard power space dynamics employed by China. Today we have with us uh, Rick Fisher and Namrata Goswami. Quick introductions. Uh, Rick Fisher is a senior fellow at uh, International Assessment and Strategy Center. He has been a consultant, uh, uh, an expert on PLA issues for the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission chartered by the US Congress. Uh, and he's also the author of book, uh, China's Military Modernization, published by the uh, Stanford University Press. He also uh, had been an advisor with uh, the Taiwan Ministry of Defense in 2011. So uh, welcome yet again to Diplomacy Direct, Rick. Thank you. And uh, we have Dr. Uh, Namrata Goswami. Uh, she's an analyst and authority on the uh, space governance and has authored a book, uh, Scramble for the Skies, The Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space. The Outer Space Project, uh, which is another project which was supported by the Minerva Initiative Grant for Social Science Research by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, in the past, she has worked with uh, India's Ministry of Defense funded uh, uh, you know, the think tank, uh, which is uh, Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies. Uh, she teaches at uh, the Thunderbird School of Global Management at uh, Arizona State University for their uh, executive masters in global management and uh, space policy. So welcome both of you. Uh, it's, it's really uh, good to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, uh, with the recent events, uh, we, we've seen that along with direct uh, ascent, uh, the, the ASAT weapons, and uh, uh, China is also believed to be developing their space weapons. In, so, again, in, in 2016, China launched the uh, Eulong-1 uh, space uh, craft on the Long March 7 rocket. Uh, China claims that the Eulong is tasked with cleaning up space junk and collecting man-made debris in the space. Uh, fast forward 2022, Chinese spacecraft with robots uh, grab and throw a dead satellite into the graveyard orbit. Uh, China has this capability of sending robots for repair work on satellites in space to fix their civilian satellites. So now with all of this, uh, Namrata, can these be used to latch on and infiltrate the military satellites of Quad to render us help helpless? Um, yes. Uh, so basically the strategic concern with China's, for example, as you stated, an ability to grab a satellite in geosynchronous orbit and send it to a graveyard orbit uh, can be also used for dual purposes. So, and that's the concern that you hear, uh, including in testimony to the US Congress, that they can, for example, use a robotic arm to grab a very strategic satellite for the US, say in a Taiwan scenario, right? If there is an escalation in conflict. And the bigger concern for me is that the US uh, satellite infrastructure as it exists today is not made for this kind of scenario. So first of all, it is not uh, made to defend itself, for example. Secondly, if you want to uh, have the capability to maneuver away, right? For example, if a Chinese, say, uh, satellite comes close or a robotic arm comes close and wants to grab a U.S. military satellite, I don't think the U.S. satellites are uh, equipped today to maneuver away quickly. It's very difficult. And the Chinese capability is very quick as well. And so they, in short, to answer your question, yes, they have deep implication for uh, US uh, command and control, strategic communication. And uh, I'll end by saying that if you look at some of the rationale that came out of the uh, Chinese military academy, Rick, I'm sure will have a lot to say to this. 
some of the papers that I have seen, they actually rationalize this uh, capability. So their argument is that conventionally, the U.S. is much superior to uh, China. In, nuclear, uh, in the nuclear realm, of course, uh, it matters on survivability and minimum deterrence. But when it comes to space, that could be an asymmetric uh, advantage China has because the U.S. military is much more dependent on space than China. That might change in the next 10 years, but today. And so, yes, this capability has deep strategic consequences. So, Namrata, also you had uh, earlier mentioned uh, while talking to Wall Street Journal that uh, Chinese space station would be operated by China Any, you know, in, in any uh, terrestrial uh, space-based uh, and uh, aerial assets have become a common entity. And now, uh, you know, the they come under the periphery of a direct attack by this. Now, decisions for research or for military purposes will be determined by the CCP directly. So we know where this is going. Uh, Rick, you are the military and strategic expert and you've been saying that space tech uh, helps, uh, you know, collecting uh, intelligence, uh, calculating the movement of the forces and communicating with other countries during the military and humanitarian crisis and can be a real game changer in a large scale war. So what are the military implications that you see other than these that can be deterrence to defend align, uh, you know, allied nations like Quad, uh, as the Tiangong is available for operations by the other nations, uh, bringing the space factor to a new age war. To quickly simplify this is that like countries like uh, Turkey or Iran, you know, they they can lease or sublease a part of uh, Tiangong, and we we can see two groups forming uh, the way that you know it it can lead to you know another world war and this time involving space. So what do you have to say about that? Thank you, Vipal. Yes, uh, the manned Chinese space program is also controlled by the People's Liberation Army and has already been used by the PLA to obtain uh, military benefits. Uh, the first uh, seven manned Shenzhou space capsules all carried dual-use payloads either optical or uh, radar or electronic intelligence gathering uh, systems. And uh, the Shenzhou 7 mission was used, in my opinion, to practice an interception of the U.S., uh, European, Russian International Space Station, complete with the uh, simulated launch of a projectile, that being a, a microsatellite. Of course, it didn't uh, collide with the ISS, but it came within uh, 45 kilometers of the ISS. And, uh, well, I, I wrote about this at the time. Uh, it did, really did not spark any concern from American or Russian officials, uh, but, but I think it's, it was there. It was there. And, yes, to your question about the Chinese space station, uh, uh, Tiangong, uh, yes, the, the predecessors... Uh, Tianzhou uh, were were both equipped with either cameras or to launch microsatellites, and in as much as the space Chinese space station is, uh, in my opinion, a copy of the previous uh, Russian Mir concept of uh, combining uh, and uncombining uh, uh, specifically outfitted uh, modules. Uh, and uh, had the Mir space station continued on into the 1990s, uh, the, uh, the the Russian designer was was ready to turn that space station into a, a station for Earth bombing platforms. So the the Chinese would be aware of all this. I mean, you can you can pick it up and read it in in uh, the 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 history written by uh, the Russian manufacturer back in the the the, the mid 90s. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yes, uh, the, the Chinese space station could be equipped with uh, uh, new modules that are that are equipped with any number of either passive or active military systems. The the Tianzhou uh, resupply craft that that supply can 
is, is capable of transporting up to six tons of cargo. Today, that cargo sustains the crew on the space station, but in the future could contain weapons that would be uh, used in the event of, of a conflict. And, and this dual use uh, uh, militarization of the Chinese manned space program, in my opinion, will continue to the moon and beyond. So, and 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 yes. So the the space leadership. So uh, and 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 you hit that chord quite right. So uh, the twenty twenty one CPC's national uh, white paper shows what space leadership means to China and the people of PRC. So, uh, Namrata, how does the ILSR MOU between uh, Russia and China lasting until uh, 2035 and the moon and the Mars missions pose a threat to the democratic alliance. Sure. So uh, if you look at the Russia-China strategic partnership, so I look at the Russia-China space collaboration in that larger context, right? So there are arguments and articles coming out, for example, in the, in the U.S. that points out that this is a opportunistic relationship, so it doesn't have substance. I actually push back on that particular argument because if you trace the actual history of the relationship after the fall of the Soviet Union, China has actually made a strong strategic commitment to build that relationship. And so in 2000, they signed the Treaty of Good Neighborliness, which was supported by subsequent uh, leadership, for example, Jiang Zemin, Hu Zengtao, and then uh, President Xi, when he became president in 2013, uh, he pointed out in a speech in Kazakhstan and then in Moscow that the Russia-China relationship is one of the key major relationships that they are building. And so they've included space in that particular collaboration. So to answer your question, and I've written about this, that if you look at the rationale behind the Russia-China uh, you know, moon uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, to establish an international lunar research station by 2036. So they have given out a press release in which they've also pointed out the systems that they are going to build. But you see the larger grand strategic thinking is that this will offer an alternative framing to countries to partner, which would question the US leadership in space, right? And so if you look at China's lunar program today, of course, China is the only country that has presence on the moon with the Chang'e 4. Uh, they have a relay satellite in Lagrange Point 2. And as uh, if you look at their white paper of 2021, one of the very interesting conceptualization that China has pointed out to is that they view the moon and Earth as a cislunar operational system, by which they mean that this is a domain where they would not just look for uh, civilian exploration, but also thinking of establishing the strategic high ground. And by that, uh, controlling access to some of the resources that there are there on the lunar surface, including the South Pole, resources like water ice, uh, helium-3 for nuclear uh, fusion propulsion, and also rare earth uh, metal, right? And this has been stated again and again by their lunar space scientists in papers, in speeches, and in uh, roadmaps put out. So, uh, and Russia, why? and this is again, I think I'll end with this. So, if you look at President Putin's speech of April 2021, uh, during the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's first uh, launch to space, he pointed out that Russia will collaborate with China in building a national security space architecture. Russia has very advanced uh, uh, you know, space capacity, including get inspector satellites, rendezvous and proximity. And so they are building it as part of not just low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit, but they're extending this particular partnership to the moon today. It looks very benign because they say it's a research station, but what it means, it means that Russia and China will have a permanent presence on the lunar South Pole, which is a very strategic area for the moon. They're talking about uh, establishing presence in the Earth moon Lagrange points, which are very critical points. And so, and with, in, as a direct challenge, to a democratic space order that is uh, led by the United States. So, so it is a challenge uh, in that particular context. Sure, I, I would further add, I, I agree with everything Namrata has, has said, but I, I, would, I would add that China's goal on earth is eventual political, economic, and military hegemony. And in order to do that, uh, to accomplish that, that goal, 
China is going to require the full support of Russia, and it is also going to require hegemony in space in order to defend and preserve its hegemony on Earth. In, in, in theory, any country that have, would have access to space and to the moon could obtain the resources on the moon or Mars that they would require to build the military capability on Earth to wiggle out of Chinese hegemony, Chinese Communist Party hegemony on Earth. The, the, I think this is how the Chinese think. This is how the party and the PLA think, and they want to lock in their hegemony on Earth with hegemony in space. Absolutely, absolutely, and so basically, the uh, the the overall the spectrum that we are looking here is you know now coming to the weaponization part, right? And uh, uh, so we are looking at kinetic, non-kinetic, uh, small drones to supersonic ballistic missiles, all of that. Uh, just to elaborate on one of the programs that the uh, the the, the uh, concentrated solar waves beaming mechanism that started in uh, 2010 under uh, uh, SBSP uh, that can be weaponized to precision aiming the microwaves at uh, targets on uh, ground and air. Uh, in addition to this, the uh, like like uh, uh, Namrata has brought out the the Russo Chinese space. Uh, collaboration and uh, the subsequent assets that has grown by 70% in the last, uh, you know, as acute as two years. And this will pose a significant challenge to the armed forces of, uh, you know, uh, forces, you know, that are going against or, you know, uh, uh, as, as, as China and Russia boost their capabilities in space with the uh, Roscosmos and the uh, CNSA MOU. So, uh, Rick, how is uh, U.S. intelligence preparing for foreign threats in space, uh, destruction of other satellites, jamming the communications um, and, and, and the GPS for civil purposes, uh, or uh, even the denial for basic civilian services? So, so how is that addressed? Well, Vipal, there, there is an argument that the United States has taken steps uh, may have even prepositioned things in space that uh, are uh, intended to deal with potential threats. Now, uh, nobody can really speak to that because all of that capability is is very classified, and and uh, the United States so far would not want to admit to having made such preparations. But one can look at the formation of the space force well-funded, $24, $25 billion a year. Indeed, the Space Force is, is now a, a kind of a combatant command, if you will, that is, that is combining both uh, intelligence, uh, communications, uh, uh, military communications, uh, missions uh, and, and assets, as well as potential future active combat capabilities. Uh, at a minimum, the United States is at least well positioned to begin to defend itself in low Earth orbit and beyond. But we, we don't know what steps have been taken to that end, and we, we probably won't know what steps will be taken because all of that will be kept classified. Uh, but I don't, I, I, I have high confidence that leaders and planners in the Pentagon are, are well aware of the capabilities that are coming along, have been already developed by the Chinese and the Russians, and could, that could potentially evolve in the future, and that we're just not going to sit passively by and uh, let our interests be uh, compromised or defeated. Yeah, so, I would like to actually, Bipul, if I may, if I can add to what Rick said, I think uh, while we are, we, sh we should hope that the U.S. intelligence community is taking China's space uh, uh, space capability, if I may, civilian and military seriously, uh, and U.S. Space Command should be having uh, some awareness, or as Rick said, classified systems. But see, the problem is there is a great strategic, uh, you know, uh, blindness which I see. 
and which is that there is an underestimation of China's capabilities. So the very fact that the U.S. had to establish a U.S. Space Force in 2019, if you listen to the conversations, the, the uh, testimonies, uh, Mike Rogers uh, and others, their concern was that the Air Force was absolutely underestimating China's space capabilities and not really understanding that this is a very, uh, this the PLA, for example, had made space a part of integrated joint operations since 2015 in their doctrinal changes and established the People's Liberation Army strategic support force, right, to concentrate on space and cyber. And I think now, of course, there is a reactive reaction to what China has already achieved, right? And yet, again and again, when China tests, for example, the uh, fractional orbital bombing system, uh, which was reported by the Financial Times, there was great strategic surprise as to how was this even possible, because this could be a game changer, because as you know, there are technological uh, issues if China is actually capable of that. And so I think while uh, we are sanguine that, of course, the U.S. is building the capability, keeping in mind China's space military capacity, including its several uh, jamming and blinding and laser capability and kinetic uh, ASAT, I think there is also a strategic tendency to underestimate China. And not just in military and civilian space program as well. For example, I remember when I was presenting here uh, in the U.S. about China's uh, plan to land on the far side of the moon uh, in 2019. And this were presentations I gave in 2016-17. No, nobody in the room, including NASA scientists, believed that this is possible. They argued that China does not have the capability based on opinion, not based on fact and assessment of technology. And then when China landed, there was huge strategic surprise and anxiety, right? And I think, I hope that situation has changed because China has demonstrated capability now, but there is still that tendency to underestimate China's capability. And I think that could be a blindness. Absolutely, and things have, yes, Rick, please. Yes, yes, well, what Namrata says, again, is is absolutely correct. I mean, I uh, for, for 25 years, I, I have been, arguing the same argument of uh, underestimating Chinese intentions and their gathering capabilities. And uh, this, this, this very debate has been very hard fought uh, and uh, emotional uh, within both uh, the civilian analytical community as well as within the government community as, as far, as far as I can gather. Uh, and uh, are we yet ahead of the curve? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. Definitely, uh, the, the Chinese have a highly developed you know, thousands of years of, of practice in concealing capabilities, denying transparency. Uh, so even if we think we know what the Chinese are up to, uh, there, there's always something that they're hiding, uh, a surprise weapon that they're concealing and waiting just for the right time to use. Uh, so this, this just goes on and will go on as long as the Chinese Communist Party uh, is in power and bent on hegemony. So basically this, this is another plot for another movie and Kevin McKay can actually, uh, Adam McKay can actually uh, make another movie like Don't Look Up. So don't look at China, right? <laughs> That's another movie coming up. Anyways, so extrapolating a lot into this. So we are getting a feeling, uh, you know, that the Cold War uh, all over again. Uh, but this time it's it's all, all on steroids and the whole world is on it, right? Uh, Chinese uh, National Space Administration, CNSA, was the, um, the output of the Cold War like... Uh, like like how NASA has been. And now this is how, uh, through the history, geopolitics has played its part in developing the deadliest of weapons. Uh, and I'm talking about the Soviet FOBs that China has adopted now. And the FOBs, that's, that's your fractional orbital bombardment system, can go around the planet in hypersonic speed and has the capabilities of uh, destroying entire cities with... Uh, less deterrence and precision hitting by, you know, entering the orbit and, you know, getting into, you know, entering and exiting the orbit and uh, at, at the right time. And, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, even the most advanced missile systems are you know almost useless against it so uh, talking about the fobs uh, you know once launched can get into a uh, low earth orbit and stay there for a, uh, you know as long as it needs and can deorbit and attack nine times faster than uh, uh, in any jet in operation today and uh, it 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 is a far advanced answer to the icbms with heaviest nuclear car- uh, carrying payload namrata should the world now start worrying about a plausibility of every chinese satellite in fact you know uh, as if it's disguised nuclear warhead and you know from a governance point of view how can the world be sure uh, and secure under this threat sure that's a great question so i mean china is a signatory to the outer space treaty of 1967 where one of the articles stipulates that you cannot place weapons of mass destruction in space which means nuclear weapons right it does not have any such restriction for conventional weapons of course so in if if we can hold china accountable to that i mean they are treaty obligated not to place weapons of mass destruction in space now the other the question to answer then is will china make an argument that if for example their nuclear capable a uh, fractional orbital bombardment system they call do they don't call it that uh, they call it the test of a reusable spacecraft the chinese ministry of foreign affairs if that is nuclear tipped and crosses low earth orbit is that placement of weapons of mass destruction in space because inter- intercontinental ballistic missile by nature uh, crosses space right including us uh, icbms so we have to make those legal definitions clear now but i think the world now the question about you making the point about what does it mean for the world right for example this particular test that the financial times reported and has been confirmed in testimony to the us congress uh including us air force secretary has uh confirmed that this test has happened so uh i would argue that this actually poses strategic consequences for the us because the us uh, radar systems are pointed towards the north pole and so missile defense is dependent on that but uh the uh, the orbital bombardment system can actually come from the south pole and so and it can traverse the curvature so the technology is that it can traverse the curvature of the earth and the radars might not see it and it might be too late by the time it sees it right which means this poses a great strategic vulnerability today if if at all they have uh that capability right which is alleged to be successful test and is hypersonic so that's the biggest consequence for the world that you have a weapon system that china possesses for which you do not have a missile defense system uh that can take it out and that means uh any response for example to a taiwan scenario by the us will have to take this into account right and so china's basic uh as rick was saying are two things in space right one is that it wants to establish its leadership in space by 2049 which is the 100th year anniversary and to use space for operational technical tactical advantage in its sphere of influence as it describes it which is the indo pacific right and so yeah it has consequences uh and any satellite nuclear tip satellite would have consequences too but then china will have to answer legal questions at the level of the united nations uh rick there there are uh, other implications much, as well uh the use of a uh, well quote quote unquote civilian space launch satellite launch center to conduct the, uh, the fobs test raises uh the poss- raises the concern not really often expressed that all of china's space launch centers are dual use to the point of being able to launch offensive weapons and this is something that simply has not been included in estimates of uh, china's order of battle it also the use of the the, the emergence of the chinese uh, fobs also points to the strategic importance of antarctica and as as uh, namrata pointed out uh, fobs is is seeks to exploit the southern access because the united states really only defends its northern approaches so antarctica is an area where the chinese have been developing uh, a a uh, and in investing heavily to create a presence they are investing to create a presence 
in Argentina, currently uh, uh, trying to rearm Argentina to foment a second Falklands conflict and benefit from the outcome of that conflict. Uh, uh, So the Chinese are investing in control of the Southern Hemisphere uh, at the same time that they are developing these weapons that utilize and require uh, control of the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, this is, again, another Chinese axis of attack that uh, I I would uh, offer is probably taking analysts and observers in Washington by surprise. Yeah, and I'll just add to Rick's point. I think Rick makes a really critical point and which I try to put out in my research too, because there is this assumption in the U.S. strategic community that China's space infrastructure is a mirror of the U.S. space infrastructure. We have NASA and then you have the Space Force, right? They collaborate at times, but they are not co-joined, right, by law. In the in China, that's not the case. So Chinese space institutions are, are under the State Administration for Science, Technology, Industry for National Defense, SUSTIN. And CNSA, which is supposedly their uh, counterpart with NASA, comes under SUSTIN, right? And so it's a very clear uh, domination of People's Liberation Army for historic reasons and continues. So it's a it's a military program uh, and they have a civilian component, right? I'll give you, I'll finally end with the example of which uh, institution actually developed the FOBs. It's the China Academy of Aerospace Aerodynamics, which comes directly under the China Academy of uh, Space Vehicle Technology, KC. Right. And Casey is a civilian company that develops the Long March rockets. So can you see the connection of military to civilian? And it's very clear. And so they are using their civilian infrastructure, supporting a a weapon system that actually they have demonstrated. Right. According to U.S. intelligence and others. Of course, they continue to deny it that they they say this is a civilian reusable uh, launch vehicle. Yep. So. Uh, so after the Sputnik was launched in in, in uh, 1958, there was a similar deep concern in global community, uh, culminating the formation of uh, United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, uh, and it you know it, it it is time to jumpstart uh, the uh, the the uh, the committee on peaceful use uh, uh, use of uh, outer space. Uh, the operations yet, uh, you know, have have to start again, right? And what could the governance that you see could be? Uh, and what are the guidelines that can come out? And uh, how should the new reform look like? Uh, Namrata and Rick, uh, both of your remarks, please. I'll let Rick go first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as, as for the actual utility of a United Nations uh, committee to, to uh, promote and uh, uh, insist on peaceful norms in, in outer space or on the moon, I mean, okay, fine. It's, 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 uh, an, it's an effort that should be made, but it's certainly not an effort that we should hang our security interests on. Uh, A UN committee is not going to be able to defend our interests in in space or on the moon or on Mars. Uh, The American approach by establishing and promoting the Artemis Accords and inviting now 20 countries to sign on to these accords is perhaps an active but peaceful means of promoting non-military behaviors in, in, uh, especially on the moon. Uh, I I think that it would be of great importance if India were to join the Artemis Accords uh, to add its weight in as much as India will be an active participant in exploration uh, and resource exploration on the moon that it, uh, if, if not join the U.S.-led Artemis Accords, invent its own accords and invite uh, other countries to join its accords. But uh, this is at least one way of uh, promoting 
uh, non-military activism, at least on the moon, that can promote non-military behaviors. But again, as as Namrana points out, uh, there, there is no division between the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese space program and all of its dimensions. And the PLA is going to seek military advantage out of whatever activity it it funds uh, in, in outer space. So it's certainly worthwhile to try to make the Artemis Accords work or uh, uh, accords uh, established by another country for the same for the same goals, but uh, it's it's again it's not something that will guarantee our security at the end of the day. That will require an investment in capabilities that can be deployed very quickly for our defense. Yes, uh, if I may, uh, Vipul. So yeah, I agree with Rick. Actually, uh, one of the reasons why consensus is so difficult, uh, even at the level of the UN, uh, is because of the national security dimension, right? Nations are correctly worried that space is also a part of their national security and defense. And so if you agree to a particular principle or treaty, how much does that compromise the capability to then have the military forces respond to a situation that they have to, right? And so, uh, I mean, I think when you think about uh, how do you mitigate or at least respond to a scenario of weaponization in space, right? We already have militarization of space. We use space for military operations on Earth, including China. Rick was pointing out that they want to establish that high ground so that they can establish their leadership on Earth. So the UK has brought about a resolution called 7536, uh, which is supported by the US. Uh, to the United Nations, uh, which talks about responsible behavior in space. And it includes uh, three important dimensions. One is uh, it talks about space traffic management. So how do you actually communicate with each other? Because Leo, low Earth orbit is going to get very crowded with national satellite constellations and communication satellites. So how do you actually communicate? Is there a possibility to communicate uh, satellite paths like we do for the uh, airlines, right? That's one. Second, there is a push for uh, even clearer, specific guidelines for uh, weapons in space, right? Uh, and also for an anti-satellite ban. So under the Biden administration, of course, they have a unilateral moratorium on ASAT testing, right? Which China, Russia has not signed on to. But uh, I mean, these are the kind of push out there. We have a United Nations General Assembly uh, open-ended working group that is going to meet for the next two years to work out if it is at all possible to establish certain guidelines for how space uh, uh, is seen as a, a, a an area where nations uh, benefit from and can mitigate the chances of conflict. And I think something that uh, we need to keep in mind is that the world is so different today, right? During the Cold War, you had about three to four space agencies and countries Today, you have 73 nations invested in space and from an economic perspective, right? And I think Rick made a really good point earlier that if you look at China's justification for its space program, it is the economic return that they talk about. And they argue that if you have economic return from space, that adds to their capability in military terms, right? So first you become an economic superpower, then military modernization follows. So, yeah, there are these efforts uh, at the United Nations level to establish certain guidelines. There are also non-governmental efforts to try to establish guidelines for space resource utilization. The Artemis Record is one of such effort by the United States. And, and so there are. I think I would end by saying that if we talk about India, one way that India can actually play a role in uh, creating a governance structure, for example, in the Indo-Pacific is through the Quad security partnership, right? So you have three major spacefaring nations with independent launch capacity, the United States, Japan, and India as partners, and Australia, which has established a new space agency in 2018. They have recently signed a uh, joint statement saying that space cooperation is part of their quadrilateral security partnership, but I think it needs to go beyond that. It needs to go to uh, establishing leadership of these four democracies in the Indo-Pacific and putting out a vision for space, uh, for the peaceful utilization of space, including for space resources, right? And so, and, and so I think that's where India can play actually a role 
in terms of creating uh, influence mechanisms? Yes. So basically, let's hope that China doesn't get away with yet another pandemic like, you know, global anomaly uh, and the United Nations or the group just keeps watching. Uh, uh, Rick, Namrata, thank you so much for being on Diplomacy Direct. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Vipul, for having us.